Welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof? Hello, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Walter. How are you doing? I am very well, and you? No, I'm fine, thank you. So, what are we doing today? Well, we're going to talk about the economy of Francesco, which happens to fit into a pattern of a new world order, mm -hmm. which happens to disprove the fact that it is no longer a conspiracy theory. Ah, I like that. Let's open with a word of prayer. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for bringing us together in having a discussion about the most important things. We ask that you bless us and enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, Martin, that people said, we're going back to normal once everything is over with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were of the opinion that this is the beginning of the great slide. Yes. Yes. But maybe we misunderstood it because they did say it's the new normal. Yes, and they did say it was a reset, mm. but we said it would be the great slide to perdition. Exactly. So, you know, Martin... Uh, we always try to correlate world events with the biblical picture. Mm. And the biblical picture is so sublime. So we need to do that again. We need to just orientate our minds as to where we are in the stream of time. Yeah, and what's happening is Something's happening here, something's happening here and there, and it's... If you, it looks just, disjointed. It looks disjointed, but everything links back together, and then the Bible is the catalyst that you use to see how all of this fits into... Yes, into it's, each it's other like the again. blueprint, right? Yeah. Yes. So the title, the full title of our talk today is The Economy of Francesco, Part 1. And the results of the war, not the results of war. No. Because there's a specific war going on right now. And the timing of that specific war is very interesting because it comes immediately after a health crisis on this planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, this war exposes, if we can put that in very strong inverted commas, uh, economic problems, financial problems in particular, supply line problems, and everything else that has to be rectified if you want to reset the world's economic, social, religious order. That's it. If you want to have a new order, this is the perfect scenario. Yes. Martin... Let's take this good book and let's turn to Revelation chapter 11. Now, Revelation chapter 11 is a very fascinating chapter. It sets the tone for the events in the heart of the book of Revelation. Mm. So in chapter 10, we had the unsealing of the sealed scroll which of course is a reference to Daniel because that's the only sealed scroll in the Bible. Yeah. And we have to be consistent, right? So, in other words, the unsealing of the scroll which would open our understanding to the prophetic events in the last days. Then Revelation chapter 11, before I say that, the last days, mm -hmm. the time of the end. Now, according to Daniel, the time of the end begins at the close of the 1,260 days, mm -hmm. which was in 1798, right? Now, what happened in 1798? In 1798, the beast received a mortal wound. Mm. In other words, it lost its political stature. And that's what happened when... Rome lost its political power. The papal states were taken away. It was turned into secular states. The Pope was taken captive. 
And it seemed as if the political power, we're not talking about the religious power, we're talking about the political power was at an end. But we learn in the book of Revelation that that power would be restored and that it would take a while. It would take a while to restore this power. But eventually, as it was in the Middle Ages, when the kingdoms of the world gave their power unto the beast, when the restoration is complete, the kingdoms will again give their power unto the beast. Now, before that can be achieved, there is first some underground activity. Mm. Now, when you go to Revelation chapter 11, we actually read about a conflict between this power and God's word. We're not going to do a study on Revelation chapter 11 now. We're just going to lift out some of these highlights. So there is a, a war, basically, against the word of God in Revelation chapter 11. And a new philosophy is introduced into the world, the philosophy of the French Revolution, which promises liberty from all kinds of oppression. Mm. And it also promises fraternity. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, brotherly love. Brotherly love. So in other words, what happens here is a philosophy which is embodied in a political system, a beast, will eventually permeate the whole world mm -hmm. and will finally culminate in the kings of the world giving their power unto the beast. So when we read here, this war against God's word will culminate in God's word basically being eradicated, but then it will have a resurrection mm. and everybody will have an opportunity to study God's word. So the great Bible societies were formed also in this period and the word of God went out into the world. But this power that is the enemy of God is working in mm. darkness. Mm. Now we read from verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony, those are the two witnesses that represent the Old and the New Testament, mm. the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and overcome them and kill them. In other words, there's a war against God's word. And this war is driven by a power, which is a beast, which represents a political system, which ascends out of the bottomless pit. That's the abusos. Or let's put it this way, it could also be the grave. Mm. So this power that had received a mortal wound has a resurrection. And it, with its philosophy, makes war against God's people and against God's word. Mm -hmm. And as we have seen in the previous two WhatsApp profs, that attack on the word is also infiltrating and changing the true word. It is a, if I can use that terminology, total onslaught. Yeah. That's what it is. In any case, once this beast has arisen with its philosophy and basically in darkness conquers the world's thinking and infuses the world with its philosophy, then we are introduced in chapter 12 to the, the power that it comes into conflict with, namely that power which represents God, namely God's church. Mm. So it gives us a brief history of God's church through the ages, even the time when they prophesied in sackcloth during the 1,260 days or years of papal suppression. And then it tells us that finally there will be a conflict between these powers of evil that are basically nurtured by the dragon 
And verse 17 tells us, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So that's God's people, right? Mm -hmm. So we've had the rise of this philosophy culminated in a political system. Now Rome received its political power back in 1929 when Mussolini returned a small symbolic portion of the papal states, right? Mm -hmm. And then in Revelation chapter 13, we read about the history of this beast and what it did, that it persecuted the saints and what it looked like. And it's basically a conglomerate rewrite of Daniel chapter 7. Mm -hmm. hmm? That's it. But it doesn't have complete political power because the kingdoms of the world haven't returned that power unto it. But it's working in darkness, this beast that arose out of the bottomless pit. So it tells us about the history, but it has a representative mm. that speaks on its behalf, so that it appears as if it is not he, but in actual fact it is behind mm. the scenes. And that is the second beast of Revelation chapter 13, right? Yes. So that second beast does, on behalf of the first beast, everything that the first beast was able to do quite openly before it received the mortal wound. So it tells us in this dramatic story about this particular enemy of God. And it once was, and then it had a mortal wound and it was not or appeared to be not. It appeared to have a mortal wound. Revelation says it didn't have one really. It's a counterfeit wound, mm -hmm. but it appeared to have one. And that is a is not stage. And then it rises up and it is again a is stage. Now, in Revelation chapter 14, we read about the conflict between this woman of Revelation chapter 12, the true church of God, and finally the remnant, and the system, and what the final message of warning is. And the three angels' messages are in chapter 14, right? Mm -hmm. And then the result of that we will read about in chapters 15 and 16, what happens at the end of that message the plagues fall, etc. And then we go into an eschatological section. Now, we said in a previous study that the book of Revelation is written in a chiastic yeah. structure, so often the things are in reverse. So Revelation 17 and 18 look out of sync because things happen in 17, whereas 18 actually precedes what happened there. So we must take that into account. But we don't want to do a full study. We want to concentrate in this particular study on what happened in Revelation chapter 17. Now in this study, uh, the revelator is shown the great judgment of the great hall. And it tells us that this system, this prostitute system that also happens to be a beast or a political power, is actually the leading power of Babylon. Mm. So in verse 5 we read, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So she's the mother of all the harlots. And collectively, they are called Babylon. Yeah. Now, a harlot or a woman of disrepute is a church or a religious system that is in apostasy mm. as far as God is concerned. But she's the mother of them all. So that tells us that in any council, whether it be ecumenical or religious unity of any kind, there will be a mother figure. Mm -hmm. And that is also a beast figure because it is also a political figure. 
So that is how they are joined together. And it tells us some details about this woman that she was drunk with the blood of the saints, takes us back to the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7. So we should have no problem as to who we are dealing with. Correct. Also, she sits on seven hills, mm -hmm. which is a pretty... <laughs> Descriptive. A very, a very <laughs> sharp clue, right? And we will drop down to the time when she has passed the east, is stage, the is not stage, and the is to come stage, mm -hmm. right? And we actually read that in uh, verse 10, where it says, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet, and when he is come, he must continue a short space. We're not going to go into that Bible study as to exactly what mm -hmm. that sequence is. There are other studies about that. But in verse 11 it says, And the beast, political system, that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. It's a very short description of its entire history. Mm. It was a beast power. In other words, it wielded political power over the kings of the earth. It went into a is not stage when it had a mortal wound. Then it ascended out of that deathly, bottomless pit and went to make war against God's word and against God's people, as we read in uh, chapter 12, and particularly the remnant. Yes. The message is then mentioned, and then we can follow the rest on the screen. just to set the stage for what is happening. So let's take it up from verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now that's a very interesting verse. Because if they have received no power as yet, that means that they have some power, otherwise they wouldn't mm -hmm. be kings, but they're not wielding that power together with the beast. Mm -hmm. And only when you are in total harmony with the beast do you have legitimized power. Remember we spoke about Jehu? That's it. Who wore the Phrygian cap? He was subject to Shalmaneser, and he had power to rule together with Shalmaneser as an independent, free spirit, subject to certain rules and regulations. Mm. All right, so the ten horns. Now we know that the European powers were known as ten horns, and we discussed before that whether we are dealing here with ten horns and all of the nations that arose out of them, or whether we are dealing with the division of the world into ten regions, is irrelevant. It's a symbol of the whole world that will rule together for one hour with the beast. Now, whether that is a prophetic time mm -hmm. or whether it is uh, a mention of a particular short time period, which is sometimes the case in the Bible, is not really of such great consequence. The fact of the matter is that the ten horns will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, they must adopt the philosophy of the beast. Correct? Yes. So they will also have to have the same mindset. As ah, that's exactly what the next verse says. If you look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 13, it says they have one mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, they have been well indoctrinated during the movements in darkness. And then what will they do? They shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So this is quite clear there from this statement that they had power. They wielded secular power. Yeah. But true power, according to the beast, 
is only there when the secular sword is combined mm. with the religious sword. Then you have true power. Because then you also control worship. Yes. The book of Revelation is about worship. Mm -hmm. In fact, the whole Bible is about worship. Correct. Who is the authority? Who is the authority? So they will have one mind and they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. In other words, they will use the power of the state to enforce the dictates of the beast. Mm. And this beast power makes it look like it's God's will. Yes, but in actual fact, it's her will, which in actual fact is the dragon's yeah. will, because the dragon gave her a seat and power and great authority. Now, what will they do, Martin, once they have given their strength and power unto the beast? This is very, very scary. These shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So who does he war against? God's Jesus. people. Yeah. And in the fact that they're warring against God's people, they're warring against Jesus yes. and against his word. Mm. And he says unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And Martin, when you sit, you rule. Mm -hmm. You rule. They sat in Moses' seat, Jesus said, referring to the Pharisees. In other words, they ruled yeah. over the people. So when you sit, when Pilate went into the praetorium to cast judgment, he sat. Hmm. So where does this ruling power sit? Well, it sits amongst the peoples, the multitudes, the nations, and the tongues. She's a universal power. Whether we see her or not mm -hmm. is irrelevant. She's there, exactly, according to this. The Bible says so. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now, it's very fascinating, Martin, because just prior to this, they were of one mind and gave their power unto the beast. Mm. So then they were... They were united yeah. in opposition to whom? To Christ and his people. And they will be overcome. In other words, they will realize that they have been duped when they are overcome because obviously the beast promised them mm. victory, right? That's it. But they will realize that they have been duped and there must come a change in attitude. Unfortunately, that change in attitude is too late for them. Yes, because probation has closed. It comes after the close of probation. So those ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, the ones that gave their power unto the beast, shall then turn upon her, they shall hate her, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. That's fascinating. Now, the punishment for prostitution in the Old Testament was stoning. Yes. Unless it was the daughter of a priest, then it was burning with fire. So this tells us that this whore is a priestly associate. She is the priest of someone. She is the daughter of someone, namely the dragon. Jesus said, you either have God as your father or you have the devil as your That's father. Yeah. Because Jesus said to uh, the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. So she is the daughter of that father and she will be burnt with fire. That's actually a synopsis of the entire end time happenings. Yes. Why? For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his will. Again, here we are speaking about God's permissive will. And to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. 
God is permitting this. In other words, God is permitting what we are going to talk about today in this episode. God is permitting it. Now, we can scream and shout as much as we like. This is the devil's plan. That's it. But God is permitting it. Why is he permitting it? So that his whole plan and to show him as the true God. As Lord of Lords and yeah. King of Kings. And in, to enable people to make an informed decision. So that you cannot turn back and say, oh, but I did not know. Exactly. So this must be very prominent. So God permits it and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Can I therefore conclude, Martin, that when the kings had not yet given their power unto the beast, this was far more in line with God's will uh, than giving their power unto the beast. Definitely. And it's also those words, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. He said this would happen. And it's prophetically there. Yes. So in the end, you cannot plead ignorance. You know, this is so fascinating. So Martin, when you look at this and it says, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. In other words, prophecy will come to fruition, right? Now, we've been talking about this for years. Mm -hmm. And those that are opposed to this philosophy, this biblical picture, will shout conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And they've been shouting conspiracy theory and writing conspiracy theory at nausea. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what they will say when the conspiracy turns out to be fact-checked by, <laughs> by the highest, biblical criteria. The highest authority. And turns out to be true. Then they cannot claim, sorry, we were wrong. Will there be weeping and wailing and gnashing, gnashing. of teeth? And the woman which thou sawest is that great city. Martin, there's only one church that is called a city, even by in their own ranks. Mm -hmm. And that is the church of Rome, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So even if it doesn't appear as if she is reigning at the moment, because the power has not yet been given unto her, she reigns. Exactly. They are all doing her bidding. They are doing her bidding. This is the prophetic picture. And whether we like it or not, that is how it is. Because God said so, therefore it, it is. is so. And you cannot get away from it. So now, with that brief introduction, shall we jump into where we are in the stream of time? Please. Here's the National Catholic Reporter from March 29, 2022. Why the economy of Francesco can develop a new economics and create a better world. Martin, just that title in itself. Are they creating a kingdom in this world? On earth, All definitely. Right. Now, what does the Bible say about the kingdom of this world? It will be destroyed. There will be nothing left but dust and ashes. And if you are a friend of it? You will be destroyed with it. Because you are an enemy with God, and of it, God. Right? By your own choosing. By your own choosing. So just that title alone by the National Catholic Reporter will tell you is a serious problem. Because it's in direct opposition to what the Bible is saying. So how does this better world, according to them, look like? The Francesco here is the Pope's namesake. St. Francis of Assisi. The idea is to develop a new economics for the 21st century, one that responds to the challenges of our time. Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Confucianists, indigenous leaders, secular philosophers. Stop there. What did we just read? She is the mother of? Harlots. Harlots. And what was the harlot again? That, that is against God. It's an apostate system. Yes. Okay. All right. Secular philosophers have found time and again that there are common perspectives on how to proceed 
for the global common interests, common good. Mm -hmm. We strongly recommend the great joy of delving into the Church's social teachings, starting with the Pope's recent encyclicals. The young people in Assisi and our own students around the world heartily agree. It's not all that often that one gets to engage intensively with the thoughts of Aristotle, Jesus, Thomas Aquinas, Francis of Assisi, the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople, the grand imam Sheikh Ahmed El Tayeb of Al Azhar University and Pope Francis. Martin, if you have Aristotle there and Jesus in the same sentence, is there harmony or is there. There is a big conflict. Conflict. That cannot be. You cannot put those two in the same, uh, on the same level. Okay. Now, if you want to put Jesus into that category, mm. together with Thomas Aquinas, who says there's no sin if the poor take that which belongs to someone else, because it doesn't really belong to them, even if the commandment says, thou shalt not mm. covet thy neighbor's goods, he, Thomas Aquinas, who is a according to them, a saint says that stealing is perfectly fine under those circumstances. And Jesus said, if you want to have life, keep the commandments. So we have, we have a dichotomy here, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, to throw Aristotle into the mix is, is just absolutely amazing. So this Jesus cannot be Jesus of Nazareth, right? No. This it, must be another Jesus. Yes. Could this be Barabbas? Yes, that's it. <laughs> we'll talk about that at another stage. But also interesting, on the, uh, you see, the basis that they want to say this new economy has, can bring together is built on the recent encyclicals of the Pope. Correct. Which was, and you read it in here, the fraternity, uh, fraternity that's the br uh, fraternity, the brotherly love, and La Dao to see. Yes. That's on the environment and all of this. Yeah. That's how this whole thing gets together. Now, when we read there in chapter 17, we read about the two aspects of this power. She's a beast. Mm -hmm. She's a political system, right? But she's also a harlot. Yes. She, in fact, she's the mother of the harlots. That's the religious system, right? That's it. So this here seems to me to be a pointer that the religious system is entirely on board. That's it. So the last final little thing that must happen is that the political system must come on board by giving their power unto the beast. Mm. That's what we're waiting for. The first one has already been fulfilled. Now, a couple of years ago, who would have imagined that that could be fulfilled by now? Hmm? I, I don't even think you have to go far back. About three years ago, this wasn't that clear. It wasn't that clear, right? And when I was married, as I said many times before, my wife's family didn't attend the wedding because I was of uh, <laughs> yes. the beast power. So the church's social teachings make it possible for everybody to join in this 2,000-year-old conversation. This conversation can be a springboard for a better world. That is the true goal of the economy of Francisco. So this utopia that he's talking about is actually the great nightmare that will bring about that situation where the kings of the world will actually start hating her and will destroy her. That's it. A time such as never was of trouble. But we'll be caught in the middle, mm -hmm. right? But once they've given their power unto the beast, they're going to make war with God's people. Yeah. So we must be... On the verge of that event, right? On that knife's edge. Okay. Now, how do you create a great crisis? One of the things you do is you introduce a food crisis. Yeah, and that's also a result of this war. Okay, so you need to have a precedent mm. in order to explain the food crisis. Now, they're talking about climate change. But crops still keep coming in in spite of their arguments in favor of their climate change theories, right? Yes. 
although as we've discussed many times, the facts and the philosophy just don't seem to gel. So we need another crisis. So how about a supply line crisis? How do you affect the food crisis? Well, you introduce another calamity, another form of chaos, out of which you then create the order that you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we go into the pandemic, <coughs> that already started this food crisis. Yes. Supply lines and even production. Yes. Well, here's a, a nice discussion that took place on Weon. And uh, it's interesting that this channel was banned for a while and then resurfaced. Yes, YouTube banned them. And then there was such an outcry that within 12 hours, the channel was reinstated on YouTube. Well, let's, let's hear what they have to say. This war, ladies and gentlemen, is bleeding all of us. Do you have a car at home? What does it run on? Oil or gas, I'm guessing. Taking that car out will become more expensive, courtesy the war in Ukraine. You see, nearly 12% of the world's oil comes from Russia. It is among the three top players in the oil market, and this country is now at war. How expensive exactly? Let's talk about India. The Reserve Bank of India says every $10 rise in crude prices adds about 0.5% to inflation. Basically, the devastation of Ukraine means inflation for you. This war has disrupted the global supply chain of sunflower oil. And soon, kitchens around the world will be suffering. Once again, take India, for example. More than 70% of India's sunflower oil is imported. 380,000 tons of sunflower oil shipments from the Black Sea region to India are stuck. Reports also say the prices of edible oil could go up within weeks, meaning cooking at home will be more expensive. Ordering in will also be more expensive. Ukraine also supplies corn. In fact, it is one of the world's top five corn exporters. In 2019, Ukraine traded 35.9 million metric tons of corn. Russia too is a big player. Together with Ukraine, it accounts for 19% of the world's corn supplies. This war will have a ripple effect on the cost of corn syrup, corn flakes, even popcorn. Ukraine, by the way, is China's biggest corn supplier. Then there is wheat. Russia is the world's largest exporter of wheat. It accounts for 20% of the global exports. Ukraine supplies 10% of global wheat. In 2021, 70% of Russia's wheat went to West Asia and Africa. This region will soon have to pay more for flour, pasta, pita bread, pizza, basically every wheat-based product. Well, so we have a food crisis and Every nation on earth is talking about a food crisis. And we have an energy crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, Martin, isn't it interesting that not so long ago, in fact, under the Trump era, America was totally independent in terms of its oil needs. And these were immediately shut down when the new administration took over. It's almost like a preparation for a crisis. It was almost as if they were preparing for a plan. Yes. And food supplies. So you need something very specific. Mm -hmm. Because food supply cannot be explained just from exports from Russia and Ukraine. There are other nations that can take up the slack. The United States is a massive grain producer. Many countries have the capacity to produce grains. So there must be some other factor. And that, of course, was fertilizer. Because one of the components in fertilizer apparently is largely from Russia. Mm -hmm. So that affects farming worldwide. Mm. So in other words, what they are saying is there's no such thing as an independent country. No. Everything is Interdependent. Interlinked. If one sneezes here, this one catches a cold. All right. Now, how long have they been planning that? For decades. That is, you see, this is all part of the old world order. Yes. If you take uh, the situation just in our own country, how the laws changed many years ago as to what was permitted to be grown in terms of, let's say, anything, wood, for example. Mm. No, this had to come from that region 
or grain, this kind of grain. No, we're not going to concentrate on that anymore. Another country, Australia, is going to mm -hmm. do this, and we'll we're going to do that. We're not going to make our own steel. We're going to export the iron and import the steel. Then we're interdependent. We're not independent. You see, that was part of the Industrial Revolution then. Yes. They cooked up this whole scenario so that when they want to import plant this new one this whole thing is already in place so they made the world so interdependent that you cannot remove a cog out of the wheel without destroying the machine mm. that's what they did right there may never again be a time when a nation is self-sufficient mm. that was the plan now we have to introduce a crisis because nations cling to sovereignty. That sovereignty has to go. The power must be granted unto the beast and then you will have a centralized power. So first you must have pain so that you can produce the gain. Ordo ab cao. All right, so we see that uh, these things are already biting they're already part of the social fabric. Mm -hmm. Spain allows supermarket rationing to prevent shortages. Spanish supermarkets can legally ration consumer purchases of certain products under a new provision published Wednesday in the state's official bulletin. The text which provides legal cover says the restrictions can be applied exceptionally and when there are extraordinary circumstances or force majeure that justify it. Spain has been struggling with a wave of social unrest over runaway inflation and rising prices with lorry drivers striking, production stoppages, mass protests by farmers and fishermen. Soaring energy prices have also driven Spain's inflation rate to a 37-year high jumping to 9.8% in March, up from 7.6% in February. Martin, is this a Spanish problem? No, it's actually a worldwide problem. Yes, it doesn't and matter which country you look no, at. No, it's right? interesting. Like you just said previously, there's, a, there's still pain with this. Yes. This, you know, the pain, to, they must, we must still, and some of them, get to the game. Well, I don't think this could work if you took uh, two Pacific islands which were at war, for example. You needed the superpowers to come into conflict with each other or potentially to come into conflict with each other in order to make this thing work. And using the pandemic where there were already these types of rationing going on, People are, have been getting used to this, almost. Yes, they have been conditioned. Mm. Now, there's another factor here. When you start introducing shortages, then you have panic situations. Mm. Now, what if you can use these shortages to also control behavior? That's what's going to happen. Huh? So is it possible, Martin, that you could link these things in such a way that you can control social behavior. That's definitely where everything is heading. All right. So one of the things that you'd have to test is civil obedience. That's it. So you need to create some situation where you can test the willingness of a citizen to comply with certain civil obedience issues. And I think they introduced one during the pandemic. And they introduced a certificate which gives you economic access mm -hmm. or exclusion according to your choice. Yeah. You better be in harmony with the beast or else. You still have your choice. But if you're not in harmony with it, you exclude yourself. Well, They're not excluding you. The devil justifies that choice, Martin, because God does a very similar thing. God says you either comply with my commandments or you will be eliminated. Mm -hmm. So he's trying the same thing. He's saying you either comply with my commandments or you will be eliminated. He's got one shortcoming. Mm -hmm. 
His elimination is temporary. God's elimination is permanent. Time tells us the war in Ukraine is creating the greatest global food crisis since World War II, the UN says. So it's not a Spanish issue. It's not a United Kingdom issue. It is a universal issue. The UN food chief warned Tuesday the war in Ukraine has created a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe and will have a global impact beyond anything we've seen since World War II because many of the Ukrainian farmers who produce a significant amount of the world's wheat are now fighting Russians. So the Ukrainian grain will be gone and all nations will be affected. Even nations that grow their own wheat or own grain. Yes, absolutely. Even those. Maybe they will have to export it to nations that are totally dependent on Ukrainian grain. So, Martin, if you then, on top of it, make it impossible in terms of availability and price mm -hmm. to fertilize your lands, would that add to the food crisis? Oh, definitely, because then even the ones that produce it themselves have a problem. So this is a perfect conflict. Mm -hmm. We don't have to read it all. The war in Ukraine is turning the breadbasket of the world to bread lines. Now, Martin, the breadbasket of the world in historic terms it wasn't necessarily the Ukraine, but more the United States and some Eastern countries such as China, etc. But at least they qualified by saying that it was for millions of the world's people. While devastating countries like Egypt, that normally gets 85% of its grain from Ukraine and Lebanon, that got 81% in 2020, Beasley said. Ukraine and Russia produce 30% of the world's wheat supply, 20% of its corn, 75 to 80% of the sunflower seed oil, and the World Food Program buys 50% of its grain from Ukraine, he said. This is major. So where are all the other countries that produce these things? Now, Martin, I, I don't want to question these, these statistics that are being given here. But I've been around on this, in this world for a few years. And uh, this is not how I learned my history. If you take, for example, the Southern African situation, uh, Zimbabwe mm. was the breadbasket of Africa. Mm. It produced massive amount of corn. And South Africa was a massive producer exporting many, many of its commodities. And if we look at those economies and what happened particularly in Zimbabwe, then uh, that situation has been removed. I wonder whether, looking back and trying to fit it into this picture, whether it was necessary to remove some of the bread baskets. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it interesting that farmers in particular were targeted in Zimbabwe, for example? Yes, to get everybody dependent on something else. Yes. It seems as if farmers mm. are a target for many of the social actions that are taking place in the world today. Mm. Well, let's hear what President Biden has to say on the issue. With regard to food shortage, yes, we did re re talk about food shortages. And, uh, and it's going to be real. The, the price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. And uh, because both uh, Russia and Ukraine have been the breadbasket of Europe in terms of wheat, for example. Just give one example. How high do you think oil prices can get at the pump? Uh, listen, I... There's a lot of uncertainty about it. Um, they're not as high in real terms as they were um, earlier, earlier in this century. And um, they, you know, it's conceivable that they could move higher. 
Mike Gunderson's family has been farming wheat, soybeans, and corn on this land since the 1950s. He expects the weather to throw him a curveball in farming, but not a war. All the stuff in Ukraine, and there's so much volatility in the market. The U.S. imports $10.3 billion worth of fertilizer for crops. $1.3 billion of that comes from Russia, which is now off the market. The Minnesota Association of Wheat Growers says farmers lay down fertilizer at least twice a year. There's a lot of fertilizers that are 4 and 5x more expensive than they were a year ago. Fertilizer has drastically outpaced the rate of inflation. Russia's ban on fertilizer is scheduled to last until the end of the year. And while supply is already tight this year, it's the future many are worried about. Gas prices are jacking up the cost of boat rentals and charters. Leaving captains like Cody Kinney with two choices, cancel charters that are not profitable or increase ticket prices. The increases are not just hitting the tourism industry. From our boats that go out fishing to our trucks that deliver the product, everything that we use to run our business, we see a, at least a 35% increase. Nello Casarino runs Galveston Shrimp Company. He says passing those prices on to the consumer is not a reliable option. Because the consumer at some point will stop buying it. It turns into a, a ripple effect where the plants have to lay off employees, uh, you know, trucks stop moving. Well, they're pushing the food shortage agenda. And a few weeks ago or months, we heard similar stories in our own country and warnings to in this regard. And we also had a, a last year a situation of social unrest. Correct. And how that affected supplies and everything in our country. So there seems to be a war on distribution and supply lines. Here's an article in The Hill. Biden warns of real food shortage risk over Russia's invasion into Ukraine. And uh, what did he say? We did talk about food shortages, and it's going to be real. The price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our own country as well. We just heard him say that, right? Mm -hmm. Biden said at a press conference from Brussels where he's meeting with NATO leaders, senior administration official warned that Russia's invasion threatens to jeopardize food security for the Middle East and Africa in particular. Now, Martin, I tried to buy fertilizer in our own country the other day just to see what the situation was about. It was virtually unobtainable. Uh, there had been mass buying by farmers, and now there was none. And particularly some of the components in uh, the fertilizer, they say, came from Russia, therefore fertilizer would not be available. So this is a, is a recipe for food shortages. And the Bible, does it say there will be food shortages? It says famines, pestilences. And all of these things will be near the end. But the big sign is that they will give their power unto the beast, mm. right? We read that. And once they have done that, the very next step is war against God's people, against Jesus and his truth. That also tells me Everybody that will eventually, now you've got all this chaos and everybody is in a frenzy, but they will stand together because they'll have a common enemy when they go against God's people. Uh, they time. will try to find a common enemy, and it must be on the basis of some religious aspect, which they have clearly connected with their agenda. So, Martin, the Bible also tells us that one of the mechanisms to introduce this war will be to make it impossible for those who do not follow the dictates of the beast to buy or sell. Mm. So we need a restructuring of the world's financial system in order to achieve that. So a new world order also requires a new financial system. But this is conspiracy theories. Well, so they said. 
-hmm. And I'm wondering whether those that claimed that it was conspiracy theories were practicing ostrich philosophy, having their heads stuck in the sand. So let's hear some of the talk on this issue in the world. Here, President Biden is addressing a roundtable discussion with leading businesses. All right, let's see what he has to say. They're also suggesting that Ukraine has biological and chemical weapons in Ukraine. That's a clear sign he's considering using both of those. He's already used chemical weapons in the past, and we should be careful what about to, what's about to come. He knows there'll be severe consequences because of the United NATO front, but the point is, it's real. And what I want to mention very much, very, very quickly with you all is uh, one of the tools he's most likely to use, in my view, in our view, is a cyber, cyber attacks. They have a very sophisticated cyber capability. But uh, look, today my administration has issued new warnings that based on evolving intelligence, Russia may be planning a cyber attack against us. And as I said, the magnitude of Russia's cyber capacity is fairly consequential. And it's coming. The federal government is doing its part to get ready. But under U.S. law, as you all remember, the private sector, all of you, largely decides the protections that is, you will or will not take in order to protect your sources. But let me be absolutely clear about something. It's not just in your interest that are at stake when there are potential use of cybersecurity. It is the national interest at stake. And I would respectfully suggest it's a patriotic obligation for you to invest as much as you can in making sure, and we will, hurt, will help in any way, that you have built up your technological capacity to deal with cyber, with cyber attacks. First, pr to protect your own companies. Second, to provide critical, as, you, as providers of critical services that Americans rely on from power to clean water. And finally, uh, your role you can play in helping secure every American and, and every, every American's uh, privacy. For example, banks can turn on cybersecurity to, by default for every customer so America's financial data is safe. And we're prepared to help you, as I said, with any tools and expertise we possess if you're ready to do that. But it's your decision as to the steps you'll take and your responsibility to take them, not ours. You know, we are at an inflection point, I believe, in the world economy. Not just the world economy, in the world. It occurs every three or four generations. As one of, as the, uh, one of the top military people said to me in a secure meeting the other day, 60, 60 million people died between 1900 and 1946. And uh, since then, we established a liberal world order. and. That hadn't happened in a long while. A lot of people dying, but nowhere near the chaos. And now is a time when things are shifting. We're going to there's going to be a new world order out there, and we've got to lead it. And we've got to unite the rest of the free world in doing it. Did he say there was going to be a new world order, and they have to lead it? He even said that there has been a new world a world order since the Second World War. Yes. So this has been introduced incrementally. Mm. So every crisis has been used to introduce something new. Yes. And they certainly will not let this good crisis go by without using it to the full. He also said there will be a cyber attack. Yes. Did Klaus Schwab say that? Exactly the same. And did they have training sessions as to how to deal with it? Yes, just like they had training scenarios for the pandemic, and it materialized. Now, what is interesting, he said, you will have to prepare. Mm. We will help you, but we won't take responsibility. Yes, it's not their job. So when they crash the system, do they have a scapegoat? Yes. Yes, everybody is the scapegoat except them, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I was in a chat today with someone and I hear that the minister announced that a new variant is on the way and that it will be here pretty soon. Uh, he declined to give the exact date when it would arrive or by which train, 
but uh, and exactly what time. But if we have the same thing over here. There is something that is coming. Mm -hmm. They decline to give the exact time or the exact date, but it will come. It will. You see, we've already s seen s um, some of this cyber attacks pop up. All right. We've had one in South Africa, for instance. One of the major record-keeping companies in South Africa had a cyber breach. And then they sent out emails to s tell you that some of your data can be used by these people to do identity theft. So you are compromised. Yes. Now, when this happens, now imagine putting this all together. So you have a food crisis. Mm -hmm. You have a production crisis when it comes to food and you have a supply line crisis. And we've seen that cyber attacks have been used to create supply line crises. There was attacks in the United States on the oil supply lines. Mm -hmm. They could attack the electricity That's grid. It. And now he warned that they could attack the banking system. That means if there was a cyber attack, you would have no access to money. That would create a fair amount of chaos. And we're, we're building up a, a recipe for chaos here. Mm -hmm. And out of this chaos must emerge a new world order. Never again may it be allowed that countries that are so interconnected go to war with each other. They are of one mind, and they give their power unto the beast. Mm. My personal opinion is that they are playing this game according to a very well-contrived script, the art of war. Yes. Now, here's an article from Forbes. Russia and China are leading a new world order, Russian foreign minister says. A Wednesday meeting in China between Russia and China's foreign minister amplified China's continued signs of cozying up to Russia amid its invasion of Ukraine. Key facts. Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi and Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov met Wednesday in Tungsi, China, marking Lavrov's second trip abroad since Russia invaded Ukraine on February the 24th. China and Russia are moving towards creating a new, just and democratic world order. Doesn't that sound like a social justice issue from the pen of Francesco? That's it. Lavrov said in a video released by Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs Wednesday and translated by AFP. A photograph tweeted by the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs showed Lavrov and Wem bumping elbows and including the Russia-China hashtag followed by a handshake emoji, further emphasizing the country's collaboration. Wang shared Lavrov's signs of encouragement and said he left the meeting more determined to boost the relationship between China and Russia, according to Reuters. So here you have this recipe for world conflict. Mm -hmm. All the more reason to bring them all together, right? This fraternity that has to happen. Yes, because there's nobody who will win in this kind of war, especially if it goes nuclear. Mm. Al Jazeera asked the question, is the war in Ukraine ushering in a new world order? As the fighting in Ukraine escalates, the war is shaping how global powers confront future threats and conflicts. The new war in Europe has been described as a turning point in human history. It's been more than a month since Russia invaded Ukraine, causing death and destruction across much of the country. The invasion and the political disputes around us are disrupting a global order that has been in place since the end of the Cold War. Isn't that what Biden said, that there was going to be a shift which comes every so many generations? Yes. And every time that somebody said there was a world order after the Second World War, they were conspiracy theorists. Yes. The conflict is also defining how democracies will confront future threats and conflicts. But what will the foundations of the new order be? And will Western values still prevail? 
Well, Martin, the ten kings will give their power unto the beast. So Western morality will prevail as long as it is papal morality. Yeah. So instead of us talking so much, because people will say we are sprouting conspiracy theories, let the powers that be speak for themselves. Here's another video, World Government Summit, YouTube channel. And of course, the World Economic Forum is very much associated with this particular event. Let's have a look. A very, very good morning on what is the first official day of World Government Summit here at Dubai Expo 2020. And the title of this session, Are We Ready for a New World Order? And just as the world re-emerges from the pandemic, we are faced with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which certainly feels like a transformative geopolitical moment. Is the US-led multilateral system created post-World War II to manage international relations so that the world would never again see and experience the same chaos and disorder of a world war? Is it anything like fit for purpose? And if not, what is? the alternative. Your Excellency, are you ready for a new world order? The frame of thinking is still 19th century. I think this is one of the problems that we have in the international system. It's still about nationalism. It's still about state sovereignty. It's still about use of force or non-use of source of force. And I think this is one of the major, major issues. And I think where we are now, and this gets to your question, Becky, of a new mm -hmm. world order, is uh, it can go in two directions with the war in Ukraine now being a decisive element. Either the jungle is back, as the historian Bob Kagan talks, and, and that we can go into a darker era, um, or we could go into an era because of the advances of science, advances of technology, that could be one of the most prosperous, promising, progressive, enlightened, moderate, modern eras that we've ever faced. And I think we're in a moment where that's being decided, and I think the importance of the Ukraine issue is that it's a fulcrum for this, and how the world manages this and comes out of this is going to have far-reaching consequences that go beyond Ukraine. It's not about the U.S. versus China. It's about what underpins a world order is always the financial system. Uh, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71, and so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but uh, what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life. Because mm. that's the only measure of whether a world order really mm. serves. When we ask, what is the new world order going to look like, the answer is so much depends on how we handle what's happening now, which we can't even mm. agree upon. Just one last thing, because it's so essential to this region, um, is the extraordinary hit to the supply chain of food. 
And I think we cannot leave this event without speaking about the need to prepare now to prevent a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Because the loss of the fertilizers from both Russia and Belarus, mm -hmm. the enormous increase in the oil price, which directly hits farmers around the world, already has caused a jump in the wheat price, which is the single most important foodstuff for this region. And last time we saw this, that was a major contributing factor to the Arab Spring. So now is the time to think through how will we solve this? Mm. And that will be part of the answer of what will the new order work like. Martin, there were a number of factors that were mentioned there. The first speaker spoke about nationalism. Mm -hmm. Is sovereignty. That sovereignty, that that would have to go. Yep. The second speaker sounded like a modern Kissinger. Mm -hmm. He actually said that that's his mentor. Modern Kissinger, and Kissinger was his mentor. And of course, uh, Kissinger was very pro-New World Order. So he basically emphasized the fact that it is essential that we get this New World Order. And then the lady spoke about the financial system, but it, that it wouldn't be like the current cryptocurrency. No, no. Because it would not be incognito. You would be totally transparent. And there would be certain control systems mm -hmm. so that you have absolute knowledge of what's happening in the economy. Martin, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Would you also have absolute knowledge as who is partaking in the economy? 100%. Would you have to have a system in place that can exclude people? Mm -hmm. So when they said that China had already introduced it, mm -hmm. were they perhaps referring to the fact that uh, China has certain conditions attached to their yeah. economic accessibility. That's it, the social credit system. Right. And it's linked also to surveillance and all of this. It's, nothing is uncoupled. Now Martin, when you look at all of these factors, can you see the biblical paradigm being enacted before your eyes? It's clear. I, th I think the, the, the glass is getting a little bit clear. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's look at another one, which is very fascinating. So in this, in this video, the Stansbury Research YouTube channel, she refers to a document from the Fed where they are speaking about introducing this kind of world currency, right? Yeah, they want to do a digital dollar. Yes, so that's exactly what the previous lady had referred to. And now we're just uh, putting the facts together and seeing that this is not conspiracy, this is actually happening. If we would have played this video before the one that we have already played, then you would have said it's conspiracy. But now you've heard it from the horse's mouth. So that's how you can know that what you'll see now how this fits in there. In other words, you have to put the horse in front of the cart because when you put the cart in front of the horse because you have knowledge about the cart or insight, then people will shout conspiracy theory. All right. I think you, you did well by putting them into this sequence, Martin. The Federal Reserve needs to be preparing for the payment landscape of the future, even as we continue to make improvements to meet today's needs. In light of the rapid digitalization of the financial system, the Fed has been thinking critically about whether there is a role for a potential U.S. central bank digital currency. So. All roads seem to be pointing to the coming digital currency. The question is, how are they going to get people's buy-in for this? Oh, well, that's quite easy. Uh, if you uh, advise people as a government uh, to go to the App Store and uh, download the Fed wallet and you tell people there will be $10 on the Fed wallet, uh, once you downloaded it, everybody will jump on it. And actually in Ukraine, we have seen something like this. Uh, this uh, there was the start uh, last month of an e-wallet in which the government advised people you can download this e-wallet and you can get subsidies, uh, but only if you're vaccinated. So you see this merger of... Uh, 
Well, uh, e-money, uh, electronic money, the digital money, but only if you well behave. So this reminds me on the China system where the credit score is, uh, well, is, is used in, in a way to uh, take away part of your freedom if you don't behave well. And this, this is what can happen now in the West as well. Does modern monetary theory have to go digital? Well, it helps. <laughs> it helps because um, you will have um, money which is highly programmable. Uh, so you can, uh, you can uh, say to people, you, you have to spend this money before the end of the year because otherwise it, will, uh, well, it won't be there on your wallet anymore. You can uh, tell people where they uh, should spend it on. So you can, can't spend it on holidays, but you can spend it on energy and food. And I think this is uh, something which uh, authorities, they, they love it because they will get more control over their people and they can follow each and every payment and you, you will leave uh, traces everywhere. So in tandem, you know, with going digital is the push to get to zero net uh, emissions by, you know, 2050. It, can you talk will, a little bit? Yes, sorry. Uh, it will all be connected uh, because um, they will know exactly, once we have this di fully digital payment system and we all have this e-wallet, they know exactly what you buy, they know exactly where you go and they will, they will calculate your, your CO2 footprint and when you, um, when you ha buy too many airline tickets, you will be punished in a way. And, um, so it, it will all be connected. So they will tell yeah. you this is all needed to, to fight climate change. There will be the spin, but it's, it's all about control and it's all about maintaining the current uh, dollar centered world reserve system. And of course, there's a lot of there's a lot at stake here. From a UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who says uh, top five uh, things we should be fighting for around the world right now. Um, number one, fighting COVID, transforming the global financial system. What does that involve, That's, Willem? We need to change uh, the international monetary system. We need to move it to the next phase. I call this a monetary reset. He wants to ha organize a new Bretton Woods conference with the leading 20 companies, uh, countries around the world. And this reminds me of the IMF, which published this new website or part of their website in October 2020, calling for a new Bretton Woods moment, but not telling us what this was all about. And mm -hmm. it also reminded me about a speech given by uh, Janet Yellen, uh, or it might have been an interview. And the Treasury Secretary said, um, we should be prepared to build a new global economy from the ground up in a new restructured world. And then we had this speech by Mark Carney in Jackson Hole in, what was it, July, August 2019. And he called for a global monetary system to replace the dollar, according to the Financial Times. And this speech is still on the website of the Bank of England. He was the governor of the Bank of England. He's retired now. And he also said, Mark Carney, there will be a change in this unsustainable monetary system. And, and I follow many of his speeches because he is on the forefront of this uh, movement. And he had another speech in 2020 in which he said the world needs a new sustainable financial system to stop runaway climate change. Martin, there is not much that we can add to that, right? What we may add is, we told you so. Uh -huh. Because this is what we've been saying for a long time. All right, let's just summarize. We have a system where we're going to go digital. That system is totally monitored. There is the likelihood or the absolute certainty, if I may say so, if we invoke the Bible, of a social credit system that you will be forced to comply with certain conditions. Climate change will be one of them. Climate change, as we have said in previous ones, is linked to a religious scenario as well. It's like the glue. And it's linked to the mark of the beast. Everything is linked to that thing. And therefore, we have the complete scenario mm. to see the implementation of the biblical prophecy for the time of the end. The conflict between the precepts of Christ 
and the kings of the world because they will make war against the Lamb and against his people. So it's the clash of two mindsets. Now, one thing that's very interesting to me, if you were to confront the world and say to them, we're going to introduce a new currency where we will determine what you may buy, when you may buy, how you may buy, and even if you may buy. Would you have riots in the world? Oh, definitely. Would you have civil dissent in the world? You would have chaos, right? Mm -hmm. So to introduce it like that would be totally counterproductive. What if you did it the other way around, Martin? Mm. What if you introduced a total collapse of the economy, perhaps use, hypothetically speaking, a pandemic mm -hmm. to collapse certain economic situations, and then introduce a war to collapse other infrastructures and supply, supply lines, and then, uh, hypothetically, of course, introduce a cyber attack that destroys companies, maybe destroys banking systems, maybe destroys the people's lives and livelihoods, and introduce famine and total financial collapse. Then, in order to get over this calamity, you step in as the hero, mm -hmm. and you introduce a basic income. That's it. For all of humanity. So as the man said, download a e-wallet. For that you would have to restore certain cyber activity, of course. Then you introduce an e-wallet and there's money on it, which you can access provided you have complied to certain conditions. Right? Mm -hmm. So those conditions could be health status con conditions. Or they could be climate state yeah. conditions, which could be associated with the religious conditions. With worship, yes. With worship. And then you have access to this e-wallet. Then they tell you, in order to safeguard your e-wallet, we have to determine what people purchase from this. And they mustn't be able to steal it from you either because it's really our philanthropic activity to give you this e-wallet we will introduce a digital system that totally controls it so that you can feel secure. Then you will have introduced the chaos and produced a solution. If you had done it the other way around, it would have been seen as an enemy and you would have had chaos with no solution. Yes, now it's a friend. Now it's a friend. And then you have the full scenario for the fulfillment of prophecy. Martin? And I also would like to add, there's nothing that I think anybody can do about it. No, it's going to happen. It's coming. It's being prophesied. So for all the skeptics out there and all those that over the years shouted conspiracy theories and for those that think that this has nothing to do with a religious system that the Bible calls the mother of harlots, I suggest we wait till part two of this discussion. Shall we close with a prayer? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, the table has been laid. The role players are sitting at the table. And if we understand Revelation and if we understand Daniel, then we must assume that all the role players, although they might appear to be on opposite sides of the table, are actually sitting at the same table and preparing for this final onslaught against the Lamb and his people. Help us to stand strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.